welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. This is going to be an exciting podcast. Now, you know, aging is thought to be a losing battle, but it doesn't have to be. In just a minute, I'm going to speak with actress, author, and health spokesperson Suzanne Summers. Yes, she's here on the podcast after a long wait. She's 73 years young. Suzanne, who you probably remember from Three's Company, Step by Step, and other television series, she defies virtually every stereotype about getting older. And in her latest book, A New Way to Age, she shares her insights about how to live a healthy, happy life, no matter how old you are. So today we'll discuss how to stop aging like your parents and start aging with energy, vibrancy, confidence, and even, get this, a strong libido. <laughs> so, Suzanne, welcome to the program. So, so pleased to be speaking with you. It's great to have you here. You are, you know, really one of the, the true forces and pioneers in the wellness movement. And, and throughout your career, and even in your writing, you've attacked getting old or aging head on. And I, you know, I applaud you for that. And I also applaud you before we go any farther about being open and frank with uh, your listeners, your readers, your followers about health struggles that you've had and about finding alternatives to traditional medicine to help you in your uh, health issues. So that, congratulations again. Thank you. You know, sometimes in the darkness is the light. And I think that this journey that I'm on that I never planned to be on uh, began with a cancer diagnosis over 20 years ago. And at that time, when I was presented with um, standard of care, which would be chemotherapy, et cetera, I said, I can't do that. And my doctor said, you'll die. I said, honestly, with the way I think, I believe that I personally would die if I do what you want me to do. Now, that does not make for a good relationship between patient and doctor. And what I do, what I do know and what I explain in, in my new book is most people are more comfortable choosing allopathic medicine, meaning here's the, the problem, here's the drug for that problem. And that's the way most people are going to go. What I decided to do for myself and then present it to um, my constituency is if you're interested in another way, this is what I do. I never give advice, I'm not a doctor, but um, I, I, know, I always thought, Stephen, that when I was 73, I would be old. And chronologically I am, but I'm not old. And I believe it's because of the choices I've been making over the last two decades for myself. And when I lecture to women, I always say, every night before you go to bed, make an imaginary list. And in that list, put an imaginary line down the middle. And then think of every choice you made, food choices, thought choices, um, chemical choices, throughout the day. And ask yourself, does that cho cho choice lead me towards great health or away from it? And what I always say to my audience is, you'll be surprised how many choices you make away from good health all day long. So do I do it perfect? No. But I think about, I think about every chemical I'm exposed to. Um, I have an organic skincare line because I wanted it for myself with absolutely no chemicals. We even got that coveted um, uh, toxic-free insignia on ours, which means it has to be grown organically, extracted organically, and nothing upwind or downwind of the product can be toxic to contaminate it. I want it for myself, but there's a whole constituency out there, and you're running into it too. People, it's like an ocean liner. It takes a long time to take the ocean liner and move it around, but it's starting to move. There are a lot of us who don't eschew um, allopathic medicine. When you need it, you need it, and it's a godsend. And surgery, nobody does it better than in this country, et cetera. But if you can first take, from my perspective, the non-drug alternative a choice, um, uh, I feel I'm better off having done that. 
So um, some people would you know, look at you and your career and say, well, she's always been a health fanatic. She probably was you know, eating perfectly at age 15. Was that the case or was the cancer diagnosis the real switch that changed things? The veiled gift, I call it. it that was the switch. I, you know, I did TV series for what, 16 or 18 years? And on every TV series, they've got what they call the craft table. It should be called the crap table because it's filled with things that nature never designed. Everything seems to have orange powder on it. The only orange powder I know of that's healthy for you is turmeric, and there's no turmeric on a craft table. No. <laughs> so never, never seen one. <laughs> and that's what I mean. Out of the uh, out of the darkness, there's light if you look for it. Um, I believe, because of my being diagnosed with cancer, that I'm healthier today because it was like a proverbial shaking of the shoulders. And I had to say to myself at that time, what have I done in my diet and lifestyle that I played host to this disease? And I started looking at the realities of my life. It wasn't that I ate bad. I just didn't eat well. I didn't think about the food that I was eating. I didn't think about sleep. You know, I just had started writing books at that time, and I always felt if I could stay up all night and write, and then the phone doesn't ring and nobody bothers me, I was missing. You know, sleep is a game changer. I'm sure you agree. Yeah. So, so um, I, I, I just took charge of, I decided to eat as though my life depends upon it, and I eat great. I ate a high-fat, high-vegetable, high-protein diet. Um, I, uh, I mean, if you can eat, good quality fats. You can have chicken piccata with lemon butter caper sauce, and there's a lot of great food that you can eat. So it's not like I eat boring food. I eat amazing food, and I grow my own food, and um, that's nurturing and thrilling, and a cauliflower tastes so different when you cut it from the garden and you bring it right to the kitchen. You eat it raw on the way up, and then you get up there and lightly steam it. And I like to put garlic and olive oil and parsley and, and a little butter over it and just sort of scoop up the uh, art of the cauliflower. So I, I really look at cancer as a veiled gift, and it, it woke me up. And um, I, love, I love the following that I have. These are all people, men and women, who want quality of life. We want to live this long, extended life that we're all afforded now. Like it or not, we're all going to live longer. Um, but who wants to live this long life without quality? And my quality comes from bioidentical hormones. I've been on replacement for 20 years and um, good food choices. I have love in my life, which I think is a big factor. I love my family. I I do a little exercise every morning, which I so believe I've been doing it for about 15 years, knowing that we are approximately 40 trillion cells, you and I, some very anal retentive person counted, I guess. <laughs> and I know that that's our communication system, right? That all, right. all the cells talk to one another. So every morning, without the first thing I do when I wake up is I isolate one cell and I say to that one cell, I love my life, I love my husband, I love my family, I love the food I get to eat, I love that I live in America, I love my work, and then I add any more gratitudes that I have for that day, and then I release that cell, and in my mind's eye, I know that little guy's got to go tell 40 trillion other cells, okay, guess what, we love our life, we love the food we get to eat, we live living in America, we love our husband, and there's a, it takes a nanosecond, and I feel this happiness, and conversely, if I woke every morning and say, ah, oh, I don't like my marriage and my work sucks and I hate living in this country and all the negatives, guess what the little guy's got to go tell everybody? So that taught me that we are actually in control of our happiness or unhappiness. We choose it. And I think it's the same way with health. Uh, we are in control of our health by the choices we make, knowing none of us is perfect, especially me but that we do the best we can to make the best choices relative to health every day. 
So that, that's a great point. So what do you think is the biggest misconception about aging? You know, now that, now that you're 73, um, is it exactly what you're talking about or is getting old inevitable? Chronological aging is inevitable. I mean, and you can't lie about your age anymore. There's Google. <laughs> <laughs> Women used to lie about their age all the time, but I actually celebrate my age every year when my birthday comes. I think it's actually better for my brand. What I'm loving is um, trying to be aspirational for women that it's not about facelifts. I mean, if you see me in person, I don't have a lot of wrinkles, but I'm certainly, you know, I, I, my neck and things like that. I leave it because I feel that it would be dishonest in the message that I'm putting out, that if I started lifting everything up. But what I find through hormones, and then I, in this book, um, I, I interviewed Dr. Terry Hertog of Belgium. He's quite renowned in Europe. He's who, he's a third generation endocrinologist. He is the one who uh, made thyroid legal in uh, Europe, and he's very forward thinking. So I have been injecting human growth hormone for um, probably 15 years, which is an anti-aging hormone. Uh, everybody's so afraid of human growth hormone, but when you and I were both young and making a full complement of hormones, guess what? We we're also making human growth hormone. And so that keeps my muscles from deteriorating. And he then said to me in that same shot, put IGF-1 for elasticity, which is what you get from a compound in pharmacy, and also put alpha-thymosin-1, which builds up your immune system in the same shot. So a lot of people are afraid of shots. I'm not. I don't even feel it. It's a little teeny needle. But I've noticed since I was doing that, less wrinkling and in, the, in a natural way, uh, that uh, it's not that kind of super smooth skin that... that that looks false. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a reverse aging. There are just so many new things happening. So it sounds like I'm afraid of getting old. I'm not. I want, because I, I really am just, I have, I'm in love with my husband. I, I met him when I was 20, and um, I feel if there's anything to, we knew one another in other lives, I, I just knew the day I met him. I was in therapy at the time, and I said to my therapist, I met who I'm going to marry today. He doesn't know it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, this, I want to live a long time with him. So he, he does everything I tell him. I, if I hand him a handful of supplements, I go take these. He just takes them. Because I think for 83, he looks amazing. And he's got energy and juice. And when we're around his contemporaries, they're all starting to be hunched over and bad hips and bad knees and and um, they don't have the zest and the life and the sharpness. His brain is is like that. Well, it, it, it has to be the, the, the fish oil and the testosterone, which I give him his shot every Tuesday. <laughs> and by the way, in this book, Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler, I'm sure you know who he is. He's on the faculty at Harvard and um, he conducted a study, and he called me for another book of several years ago. He said, I've, I've got something interesting. He said, I just, at that time, it was a two-year study. Now it's like a, a seven-year study. That men would come to me with elevated PSAs or prostate cancer. And, and he backed up all this science in this book. So it's not me saying this. This is Dr. Morgan Taller. He said, I found with each man that when I gave them testosterone, their PSA levels went down, their prostate uh, would shrink. I said, how does that work? He said, well, I love this analogy. He said, the prostate is like a woman's breasts. And in a woman's breasts, we have ducts where we make milk. He said, but in a man's prostate, in the ducts is where testosterone makes food for the sperm. So when a man is making a full complement of testosterone, the prostate's nice and tight and small. But as he declines in testosterone, the prostate starts to enlarge, looking for its major building block, according to Dr. Morgenthaler. And as a lay person, I got that, that visual. I went, well, doesn't that make sense? And because young men don't get prostate cancer or elevated um, 
PSAs unless there's some aberration, some exposure to chemicals or things like that. So that's, that's life extending too. That's giving men a long life of quality. And in the end, isn't that what we all want? I want to live to the very end, whenever that is, um, and just die the way people used to die. Just good night, Gracie. <laughs> <laughs> Only you and I would know who I'm talking about. <laughs> that, that's right. That's right. Most of my uh, listeners uh, won't, won't get that joke, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you became very controversial in as a woman with breast cancer who says, no, 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 bioidentical hormones are very important. Uh, and, and I know you say, look, I'm not a doctor and I'm not giving, you know, medical advice, but you were kind of a lightning rod and I guess still are yeah. for, so how is our listener or viewer, uh, going to take what you're saying and deal with that when they have breast cancer and their doctor says, you got to go on hormone suppressants, you got to have, you know, radiation therapy, chemotherapy. Uh, what say you? Well, um, I often question, I was of the first generation who took birth control pills. Now, those of us, well, gosh, that was great. You can manipulate your, your cycle. If I had a hot date with Alan, I could move my uh, cycle to Monday and take a few more pills through the, it was a terrible thing to do because you're going against the nature in your body. Anytime you try to outthink nature, you're going to get in trouble. So the brain, according to what I understand with having written 27 books, is um, it recognizes a reproductive person as valuable. I'm speaking biologically. Uh, molecular bio bio biology. Uh, we are here for one reason and one reason only, according to biology, and that is to pe perpetuate this species. Now, isn't it interesting that we start getting our cancers at the end of our reproductive years? That, that says to me, the brain's going, ah, this person isn't valuable anymore. Let's uh, get rid of them. Let's give them uh, breast cancer. Let's give them ovarian cancer. Let's give them prostate cancer. So, when I, when I discovered bioidentical hormones, I had three terrible years prior to that. Um, I couldn't sleep. I was gaining weight. My mood changed. I'm an upbeat, happy person. But when you don't sleep night after night after night and you're sweating all night, you're not in a very good mood. I remember one day I sort of lashed out at Alan, which is very unusual for me. And he said, you know, a marriage can only take so much of this. I went, oh, my gosh. I, I, no, I'm not, I, the last thing I want to do is send you away. I went from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. I finally found an endocrinologist in Santa Barbara who who's doing something about bioidentical hormones. For those who don't understand, bio, bioidentical is biologically identical to the human hormone, an exact replica of what your body once made or still makes some of. The, um, the compounding pharmacies make bioidentical hormones out of soy and yams, things like that. So I took my blood test before I went to the endocrinologist. I drove up there like a man maniac the day of my appointment, and she looked at my blood work. She said, oh, you poor thing. I said, what? She said, you must feel awful. I said, I do. I said, I'm, I'm an upbeat, happy person. I have days when I think the world would be better off without me. That's how real hormonal imbalance becomes. That's how real it is. She said, well, we're going to start you on bioidentical hormones. She said, you're making uh, very little estrogen and almost no progesterone. I now realize that's the combo for breast cancer later on. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So she said, I can't give you everything you need right away. I said, why? And <laughs> she said, because you could literally go crazy. It took you a long time to lose them. You've got to build them back up slowly. She said, but you're going to start feeling a little better right away. And she said, it will probably take the better part of this year to find your sweet spot. So in the first two weeks, I honestly did start feeling better. And I would call her with my symptoms. I call the symptoms the seven dwarves of menopause. Itchy, bitchy, 
sleepy, sweaty, bloated, forgetful, and all dried up. <laughs> and I would call her saying, I itch today, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm in a bad mood today. She'd say, what have your stressors been? And if it was, there was no obvious stressor in my life, then she'd realize, okay, let's raise this a little bit and raise that a little bit. She understood the ratios perfect. And it did take me the better part of a year to get me back. And when I got me back, it was just the most incredible thing. I was sleeping through the night. I didn't need to take any over-the-counter drugs. I was in a good mood all the time. My weight went away. My hair became great. An indicator of poor um, hormonal balance is hair. And you can see it on women because we have longer hair. But um, I know this sounds shallow, but at 73, I love that I have healthy hair. I love it. Because it says to me, if my hair is healthy, then inside I'm healthy. And what this is all about, Stephen, for me, is keeping your insides young, keeping your organs and glands in tip-top shape, keeping your gut in tip-top shape, which you know much more about than I do. I want to pick your brain one day. And, um, and it all manifests on the outside. If your gut is healthy, you know your skin will glow. If your organs and, and glands are operating at max, your, your body won't wrinkle so much. You'll just have more enthusiasm and zest. And it's such an incredible way to live. And you have to give up so little. You have to give up chemicals uh, as best you can control by what you put on your skin. You know, with skin care, when, when you look at your arm under a microscope, what our pores look like big holes. And so then the visual is put a chemical cream, I don't care how expensive it is, a chemical cream on your skin, and then imagine, where's that going to go? It's going to drop into your bloodstream. Then where's it going to go? Well, chemicals love fatty organs and glands, so they go on a rampage in your bloodstream. Their favorite is the brain, which is the fattiest of all. And one of the things when I wrote my book, Toxic, that I found so interesting is that as as we build up in chemicals, the brain, the pituitary and hypothalamus, shrinks to make room for more chemicals. The more chemicals you take in, the more the poor little brain and hypothalamus and pituitary got to hide in the corner. <laughs> um, I sometimes wonder, is this where dementia comes from? Is this where all the brain issues of today, ADD, ADHD, OCD, uh, Alzheimer's? It, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I'm just as a critical thinker going, can't be good to have chemicals up there. So I recommend that I do myself, that other people do, because this isn't medical, HEPA filters in your house to just suck the chemicals out, clean with uh, non-toxic uh, cleaners. I happen to make one. Um, it's, my uh, chemical cleaner is made from colloidal silver, which as you know, is, is safe enough to drink. I don't recommend it, but it, it really does the job. And just start putting yourself in control rather than waiting for the big fist of life to come at you. Um, you know, most people wait till they are in the catastrophic state and then they start climbing uphill. What I'm trying to do for myself and to my readers is um, start now. In fact, one quick story, I, I was in, at the Vanity Fair Oscar party a few years ago. And I was standing there and I was kind of, I like to watch. And this beautiful girl was standing in the corner, beautiful. She looked like Scarlett Johansson, beautiful. And I, I could tell she wanted to come over and talk to me, but I could tell she was nervous. And finally she worked up the nerve to talk to me. And I always think that's so funny because I'm so normal. <laughs> and she said, I just hope when I'm your age that I look like you. And I said, thank you very much. I said, start now, start now. It's never too soon. Yeah, I think it's a, that's a great point, you know, and that's it's actually why uh, I wrote my book, The Plant Paradox Family Cookbook, because one of the things that I'm, I now have two young grandchildren, and I, I realized that the, you know, the sooner my daughter and her husband started feeding those kids right, the better chance they had of getting you know exactly where you and I want to be and with good lifelong health, right? And uh, in that book, and I, th I want to echo what you just said. There's a very famous study 
that anybody can look up. It's called the Appleton, Wisconsin School Study, where in Appleton, Wisconsin, a lovely little town, I visited it, they uh, had a lot of issues with behavioral issues in their junior high, uh, truancy, a lot of trip to the junior principal's office. Uh, and so what they did is they contracted with a local cafe to provide breakfast, organic breakfast and lunches for all the kids. And then they taught all the parents, you know, okay, let's replicate this at night at dinner the best you can. And they actually followed truancy, behavior, and academic performance. And lo and behold, truancy dropped, behavior issues went away, and academic performance got better and better, and they were so excited, and here's the punchline. They said, well, we need to kind of institutionalize this, so we're going to contract with a food service provider uh, because we're overwhelming this poor little cafe, and you know we're gonna keep doing this. Well, I, and I won't mention the food service provider, a very large corporation, Lo and behold, the minute the food service provider came in, everything went right back to normal because they weren't actually using organic ingredients and touchy-feely California speak, they weren't putting in any love into the food that they were making. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a great study. And uh, I, I so agree with you because I believe it's about the food and I know you do too, it's about the food. I think organic is uh, it's non-negotiable in today's world. I mean, I don't know when we ever thought it was a good idea to spray poison on our food, but it's not a good idea. I, a story for you, I was watching when Anthony Bourdain was alive. I really enjoyed his show, and I loved the way he loved food. And he went to, um, there's a very famous chef in France, and I can't remember if it was Michel Girard or it was one of those famous chef names. And so they went from Paris to the little village where the chef was from. And when they got to the village, they went to the school that the chef went to. And in the school cafeteria were the women making lunch. And, and the kids ate off of dishes that were made of real, you know, glass, you know, not, not real plastic, stuff. real stuff. And they made a great vegetable soup and all the kids finished all their soup. And then they made this great chicken with sauce that you and I would love with all the pan juices and everything and, and the uh, potatoes and the vegetables and the kids. Every plate was empty because they were feeding those kids good quality, homegrown, a real food. I always say if you can pick it, pluck it, milk it, or shoot it. You can eat it uh, as long as it's been uh, grass fed and, and not sprayed with poison. So I think you and I are on a very similar path in that food is all important today, and that's one of the big choices we make every day. I, I would have a very hard time eating processed food today knowing all that I know about what it does. So what do you, what do you say to your listeners and my listeners that, well, you, uh, I don't live in Palm Springs or Malibu or Montecito and I don't have an organic garden and it snows half of the year. Uh, yeah, that sounds great, Suzanne, but that's not my life. How do people do this? Uh, in the Midwest, for instance, where I'm from. Yeah, I usually get the, it's, it's so expensive. It's really not so much more expensive now than it, it was at one time. Because more and more grocery stores, there are, I don't know how pervasive Whole Foods is, but I know that there are other chains around the country that, for the people like us who just demand organic food. So let's say it's a little more expensive. What's, what's the most important thing in your life is health. So sometimes you, you don't get the new pair of shoes. You instead buy high quality, you know, if you're going to eat beef, uh, you know, a uh, New Zealand or Australian grass-fed organic beef. Uh, organic chicken. Um, I love fish, but man, they're sure messing up the um, the oceans. You know, for our fish oil, we gotta get little uh, Alaskan pollock way up. You know, it's it's hard to find clean fish anymore, uh, which is really a shame. But that, but we, you know, what can we do? There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, you know, I, I give a shout out to Walmart. Uh, there's a lot to not like about them, but. 
they've really insisted that their organic food is basically the same price as conventional all yes. of their produce and you know and I congratulate them and you know and they have the power to do that they can tell their suppliers hey you know we're not going to pay you unless this is organic same thing with same thing with Costco yeah with you Costco get great quality uh, organic at a great price you can buy in bulk so I don't know what other chains are doing that but the fact that there are two major American chains doing that it's available it's about how much do you want it how healthy do you want to be yeah, maybe you might have to drive a little further. Maybe it's a, a bit inconvenient, but to feel the way I feel at this age, I when I'm in New York, I'm around a lot of people who are a lot younger than me in their 40s. And a lot of them are a lot older than me in their 40s. Why? If you are if you're in New York City and you look up anywhere on any one of those high ride build, buildings, you'll see multiple uh, EMF towers, electromagnetic fields. That is like brain, you know, pulsating through your brain. They have them in the elevators. Um, the, the lifestyle there, the lack of sunshine, the lack of, of calm, uh, it ages people so much earlier. And so if that's where you live, that's where you live, but that's where the, your choices are more important than ever of your food and how you keep your apartment. And, in terms of, of, of HEPA filters and, and non-toxic cleaning agents. It makes a big difference. My husband is, is like the canary in the coal mine. He carries the HLA gene. Those people who carry that gene are more susceptible to chemicals than uh, other people. If he walks into somebody's house who's just sprayed air freshener, he starts getting facial tics and facial spasms. That's how sensitive he is. Sensitive. And when this happens to him, I think he, he's going to go down first from the chemicals. But we're all getting hit. We're all getting it. And so um, I had a beautiful perfume made for me by Tom Ford. Can you imagine? This beautiful perfume. I can't wear it because Alan is just too allergic to anything. I can wear natural vanilla oils. I put um, – I, I think the um, – the oils are very interesting, and every night before he goes to bed, I put frankincense here. I go just like baby Jesus, put a little frankincense <laughs> here. Don't have any myrrh, but <laughs> it was good enough for him. I, I also have to tell you this. I really enjoy taking care of him. He takes care of me in so many other ways, and I take care of him in health, and that's, that's great in a relationship when you take care of each other. It's very um, comforting, loving, gives you a lot of peace, a lot of calm. I think that's a good point that I want to come back to. And I want to talk about relationships because you and your husband have now been together for 50 years. Right. Right. And as a Hollywood couple, how the heck does a Hollywood couple stay together for 50 years? That is certainly not the norm. Get, come on, give us some secrets here. <laughs> oh. Um, it's true love, you know, uh, it's, I feel like we have what everybody looks for and we just are lucky enough to find it this time around. And it, it's so meaningful to me. It, it means everything to me. So I cherish it and cherish him and take care of him and vice versa. And, and I think one of the, there are two reasons that we're so happy. He makes me great coffee in the morning. I don't mean mediocre. I mean great. It's organic. He walks it around the bed, so he just hands it to me, and he waits for my, me to take the first sip, and I give him a thumbs up. Sometimes I go, not as great as yesterday, because we, we're on a 1 to 10 scale. And the second cup, he walks around the bed also, because I don't like it passed across because it's hot and it might spill. Okay, that's how I'm spoiled. Um, Three times a week, sometimes four. This is my bad habit. Uh, we meet right here. I'd love you to come over sometime. Uh, Big Al's Bar here at our house. And it started a few years ago. I'd never had a hard liquor drink in my life because I come, I've written several books about being a child of an alcoholic and my alcoholic father. And my husband, I was writing all day, and he buzzes my office, and he says, you want a date? And I said, yeah. He said, meet me at the bar. Big Al's bar. So I go down there 
And we shared a tequila and uh, listened to music. And pretty soon we were dancing and it was so lovely that we couldn't wait to do it again. And so three, four times a week we do that. Now, I had a residency in Las Vegas two years ago and I didn't hire a writer. Instead, uh, Alan and I at Big Al's Bar drinking tequila wrote the act. <laughs> and in all my years of performing in Vegas, they were the greatest reviews I've ever gotten. And I thought, because it was absolutely true, no BS. Uh, we cleaned out all the BS sitting at the bar. And um, so anyway, coffee in the morning, tequila at night, take care of each other. <laughs> So is, is there such a thing as a soulmate? He's my soulmate. I never knew if I believed him or not, but, but he is. He is. Um, I, once, I once read one of Shirley MacLaine's books, didn't everybody at that time, and she talked about the Light Institute in Galisteo, New Mexico, and how you could go there and they could regress you into past lives. And I said to Alan, I don't know if I believe it or not, but wouldn't it be interesting? I said, I know you're not into this. I said, but that's what I'd like for my birthday presents, $1,500 for four days. So we went, and he said, it's all right, I'll, I'm going to buy tamales. There's homemade tamales at this little uh, grocery store on the corner, and I'll sit on the, on the bluff and look at the beautiful scene. So I go into this little hut, and she has me lie on a massage table. She had me undress, which I thought, Whoa, okay, I don't know why I have to get undressed, but she covered me with a sheet. And then she stood over me with her hands. And then all of a sudden, I, tears came out of my eyes and landed in my ears. And all of a sudden, I was in a different place and time. And there was Alan. And this was like, I don't know why. I know it was Mesopotamia. I don't know why, but he was there. And then there was another life in Ireland. He's never Alan. He's my son. He's my brother. He's something... So maybe there is something, maybe it's all BS, and I, and I grant that. But maybe there is something to, we've been here before, we'll be here again, and we hook up with the same people. But the day I met him, I walked in, and it was, you know, like a light bulb went off. No, I, uh, I met my wife, uh, Penny, uh, at 20 years old, uh, singing uh, in a singing group in uh, Montego Bay, Jamaica, and she was in the audience with her parents and uh, we I walked over and introduced myself and we we spent the the evening talking uh, and that morning uh, we had both decided we were going to marry each other wow. she she, be, she went back to her parents room said I met the man I'm going to marry and fortunately we were both geographically undesirable because <laughs> I was at Yale as an undergraduate she was at the University of California Santa Barbara and my parents lived in Atlanta, her parents lived in Greenwich, Connecticut, but uh, we had a, a hiatus for a while, but uh, long, long story short, uh, we actually reconnected by her seeing me on the Today Show when I was a famous baby heart transplant surgeon. And we've been together for over 25 years now. And uh, the interesting thing is we, even though we diverged our lives for a reason, uh, she never stopped looking for me, and I never stopped looking for her, because, uh, yeah, you, you know a soulmate. And I, I counsel, I really do counsel my younger friends, you shouldn't have to make your spouse or your significant other into something you want to make them into. It is not going to work. Uh, I've never actually seen it work successfully. No. Uh, you'll know and just kind of keep working at it until you know. So, so, you found, so you found your soulmate. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And I dedicated one of my book, first book to her, uh, that she's my soulmate. And you, well, you, know, I, you know, your, your audience doesn't know, but pretty soon you and I are going to be neighbors. That's right. And I have a feeling I will meet your wife, and I have a feeling the four of us will get along really well. Yeah, I think so. And we, as long as you have us over to the bar, but uh, we'll have the, we'll have the tequila C margarita. No, because there's too much okay. sugar in margaritas. Okay. I don't drink margaritas. Just just tequila with ice. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, and I hope it's dark tequila. And I'll go into that later. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now uh, a hot button topic to use yeah. an interesting word. 
So people assume that having a low libido as you get older is normal and it's unavoidable. Uh, you beg to differ. Uh, why is that and what, what can everybody do about this? Well, for a woman, when she loses her sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, pregnenol, and a few others, she cannot feel sex. She's capable of having sex, but she cannot feel. And that's what I was going through in those three years. Here, I desired my husband, but I couldn't feel anything. Um, so when I restored in, in, and got it in perfect balance, my sex hormones, whoa, my sex drive came back. And now I was at an age where my children are grown and out of the house, and um, I, I, we were free to be. Now, there's a lot of talk right now, because I, I was on Megyn Kelly's show on the Today Show, um, I guess last year with my last book. And she said, I hear you and your husband have sex twice a day. And I said, yeah, but I sleep through one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what is it about men at four in the morning? Well, oh my God, then the social media, I got this thing, Suzanne Summers condones marital rape, and I thought, marital rape, are you kidding? What I was really trying to do and talk about my sex life is not too much information. What I was trying to do is to say, it ain't over. It ain't over. And if you accept that it's over, you've kind of thrown in one towel. And I'm not ready to throw in the towel yet. I, I love to get dressed up. We go out for dinner, you know, I have a tequila and um, I love those evenings. I love to date. I love the whole keeping the romance alive. And here in the desert, you can do that so well because it's conducive to that. So I'm just trying to let women know, not, you know, look at me, look what we're doing pretty much every day. And I know that sounds like a lot, but it's just, it's there, and he's juiced up on testosterone, and, um, you know, with testosterone also, what he loves is he works out with free weights. He's on testosterone and HGH and DHEA, but he's very developed, like really big biceps, which you cannot do without testosterone, and HGH helps um, um, building uh, bone and muscle. So, estrogen and testosterone and uh, anabolic, the the they build, it's, what is it, uh, osteoblast and osteoclast, okay. build and burrow bone and build bone, that's hormonally driven. So old ladies who are constantly breaking hips and, and fracturing things, it's because of, of hormonal loss. I can look at a woman, I just know the state of her health by her hair, by her posture. You know the ladies who are old but skinny, but they've got a big belly? That's hairline fractures in their spine that eventually that spine collapses, they get shorter, pushes the spine, pushes out the abdomen. Right. Pretty soon she's got this big belly that has nothing to do with what she's eaten. So I, I pay a lot of attention to my bone structure, to keeping my bones. I take uh, calcium, but always with vitamin K. And I love the, the, um, the description for vitamin K. It's good for your heart. It's good for your heart because calcium, as you know, wants to go into the soft tissues, the arteries. This is your, you should be saying this. <laughs> and uh, the K is like a little traffic cop that says, no, 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 let's go back into the bones. And that's why K is good for the heart because it keeps it away from the soft tissues. I, d I just find um, health so fascinating, understanding how the body works so fascinating. And what I say to my readers is, you are the contractor. This is your body, your life. No one's going to care as much as you. I don't, I don't care how great your doctor is. It's your life. So you be the contractor. You read. You find out. You learn as much as you can. And then when you go to doctors, you can go in knowledgeable and be able to have a conversation that starts here rather than the doctor having to start at kindergarten. And you'll be so far ahead of the game. And I hear from women all over the world. I, I feel so privileged. I have 25 million books in print around the world, and I hear from all over the place of how this has been life-changing for women. And now the men are coming, because the men saw that the wives were doing really good, 
and um, they want some of that too. And uh, this is just as much for men as for women. Uh, it's equal. You have hormones, we have hormones. You have more testosterone than estrogen, and we have more estrogen than testosterone. But it's interesting, you know, when you see old people who have weak voices and um, man boobs on men, that's because as we decline in, in hormones, a man's testosterone, as it keeps dropping, your shoulders drop, your stomach gets bigger, you get kind of grumpy, you get kind of growl, jowly, and look what happened. Your estrogen's now higher than your testosterone. And that's why you speak you know, with a high voice and you get the man boobs. Same thing for the women. As she starts to decline, the um, all the itchy, bitchy, sleepy, sweaty, bloated, forgetful, and all dried up, that that drops down and pretty soon she's she's got more testosterone than estrogen. And I don't know if Lauren Bacall was just a real estrogen kind of a, she had that deep voice, you know, if you remember. <laughs> so um, we want to stay a woman and we want to stay a man in the right balance, in the right ratios, and um, have quality of, quality of life. Long life is great, but quality to me is the key. Yeah, and I, I think that's the point that I try to make in all my books. That this, is, this is the only house I'm ever going to live yeah. in. Yeah. And if we put as much effort into taking care of this house as we do to the home we occupy or our car right. uh, or our outfits, uh, right. imagine what could happen. Um, and, you know, and I thank you again for writing a new book. So how do people find you as if nobody knew uh, where we're going to find this book? Oh, go to Amazon, go to my website. It's, it'll be all over the place. There are two other things in there that I just want to bring up that every book uh, startles me. I never know what I'm going to really... Uh, I don't have a preconceived notion other than, with each one, the title, A New Way to Age. I'm, I'm doing it, and then I bring in all these incredible doctors and scientists. What came up as the most cutting edge is cellular health which I thought about in terms of communication, like I said before. Yeah. But now there's something so fantastic. We all know when the pipes in our house um, get clogged and corroded that the, the water doesn't flow and the house, the pipes don't work as well. Well, the same thing happens with the cells with aging. These cells get filled with uh, debris. It's called autography. There's a new supplement called senolytic activator. Correct. That, that cleans out cellular debris. It's like cleaning the, the rotor rooter in the pipes of your house. Well, how about that? And then there's the other one, NAD. Um, my, not, oh, do you know it's, it's niticamide adenine dinucleotide? I could be wrong on the first word. Um, Nicotinamide. Yep. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, that repairs DNA breaks before uh, other things. That's cellular health. Again, that's reverse aging. So there's that. There's, there's so many new wonderful things coming down the pipe. And those two things that I just mentioned, um, very inexpensive. Like for the senolytic activator, you only take it once a week, eight bucks a month. The NAD is a little more expensive, but not terrible. So um, if these, this is a good time to be aging, really a good time. By the way, I just want to say one thing to you of what an what a impact you've made that um, people are talking about your approach to health and food and, um, and gut health. And I think that's one of the most important areas right now. Everybody's got something wrong with their gut. So you've done an amazing job and your career, I follow your career from um, all the facets of your career. It's really incredible, so congratulations. Well, thanks, I'm just, uh echoing Hippocrates who said 2,500 years ago, all disease begins in the gut. He's and, right. And he was right. Yeah. All right, so uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, walking the dogs in the neighborhood. On the mountain, yeah. <laughs> On the mountain. What a pleasure, thank you so much, thank you. All right, take care. Okay, it's time for the audience question. And Laura M on YouTube asks, is it possible to address varicose veins with the Plant Paradox program? Well, it's interesting. Uh, most varicose veins actually come 
from losing the valves that are basically locks in a canal that allow blood to get pumped back to our heart from our legs. If you think about it, uh, we don't have a heart down in our feet, which would be a useful thing because blood has to be pumped uphill uh, about four or five feet. Instead, we actually have muscles in our calves and our thighs that when they contract, they actually squeeze on our veins and our legs. And those veins all have little one-way valves that allow blood, just like in a canal in a river, uh, allow blood to go forward and then close so it doesn't fall backwards. And most people who stand for a living, for instance, surgeons get varicose veins, bank tellers get varicose veins, grocery checkout get varicose veins, because number one, you're standing, but you're not exercising your muscles. And so slowly over the passage of time, those valves lose their ability to match. One of the good news is part of the Plant Paradox program is to make you more active, to make you conscious of moving, to make you do some simple exercises. And so the answer is you can improve varicose veins at any point in your life, but eating is not gonna be the big component to that. It's movement that makes a difference. You have to have, uh, rather than wearing your heart on your sleeve, you have to wear your heart in your legs. So, great question. And that's all we have for today, and thank you for listening and watching the Dr. Gundry Podcast. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.